Stealth on a Paladin? I did over 300 damage before Malice noticed I existed. This bound will destroy on a mode. Double smites. One shotting your enemies. And making everyone come. Closer, join me in this video to find out how you can become a Breaking Stealth Bardadin. Before we start, the Stealth Paladin meme happens at Love Lane, which is generally Act 2. Tom stamps are in the description if you want to skip ahead. Starting things off, we pick a bard. For our first cantrip, I pick friends for the advantage on the charisma chanks and minor illusion for grouping enemies or distracting them. The origin doesn't matter too much if you're doing a solo run. My recommendation would be Dark Urge, purely for the cape you get in Act 1. Also, a send boss in Act 3 is a lot easier. My spell preferences are as follows. Launch Strata for 3 meters extra movement, which is super useful. Just remember to cast it on everyone. I've definitely been sleeping on Feverfall. In this clip, I used it to safely pass the Balant. Killing Word is just an excuse for me to use my bonus action. Thunder Wave is a great yeet and delete. I play this build as a ranged character until level 8. So here is my stat allocation. 17 strength for our weapon damage and the ton string extra damage. Our dexterity is 10. You can make a case to actually dump it all. I know, I know. Miss Evelyn, why are you dumping danks if you're doing a ranged build? Gloves are dexterity, baby. Constitution is 14. Int and wisdom are our dump stance. And charisma is our second main stance, sitting at 16. For all the proficiencies, you know we need that stealth. I almost forgot our darling's name. Mum. Me knockers. Hey, are you still with me? You'll reach level 3 pretty early on in Act 1. For our subclass, I'm gonna go with College of Swords, because I like bonking things and shooting things. Enhance ability is a really awesome spell. Let's give it a whirl, shall we? An easy 23. Excuse me, Miss Milkers, what are you doing? We're going to add another plus two to stealth. Under replace spell, I went for invisibility. Since I'm running a duo in Onamone, I avoid any fighting until I'm level four. So let's go get some gear. Shadowheart's default class is a trickery domain clearing. I won't justify that it's useful, but we're gonna disguise self as a female drow all the way to the goblin camp. Since we're at the goblin camp, we're going to get branded. Trust me, it's important for a game of bow early on. The first piece of gear we're going to get are the boots of Stormy Clamor. Let's go to the Underdark together. I'll lockpick this door in Priestess's room. This ogre didn't know how to use a ladder, so the girls bullied her. We passed a perception check, and one dice roll later, we find ourselves in the Underdark. God, Shed Heart, so pretty. So here's my technique for the Arcane Tower. I cast invisibility on myself, run past all these turrets, jump through this window, and using Featherfall, I make my way to the bottom. Picking up the sussy flower, we reactivated the lift. Using the lift, we're going to collect all these tin mask spores and the tongue of madness. Heading back to the Markinid colony, I talked to Blur to summon Amelium. The reason we did his quest is to unlock trading with him. The boots are Stormy Clamor, my favorite boots. These boots will literally carry you right to the end with this build. So how does it work? Whenever you apply a condition, you inflict two turns of reverberation. Once an enemy reaches five turns of reverberation, they're going to take thunder damage and fall Brian. How do you inflict a condition? Our next stop is a bow that inflicts a condition on hit. Back to the blighted village, I grab this antidote off the shelf. We use that antidote on a gnome, just so we can get our shoes. Remember how we got branded? We show that bad boy off to the Dwega. Put the boots right here. Oh, look at that. Sailing across the lake, we try our hardest not to shove Corsair Greyman into the drink. We find him again and start trading. I swear to God, everyone's sleeping on the bow of the Banshee. On hit, there is a chance to inflict Frightened. Gain 1d4 bonus damage to frightened creatures. Also, this works with the Stormy Clamor Boots of Trent. Before we do any fighting, let's go get the Gloves of Dexterity. Entering the Man Pass from the Goblin Camp sign, we find ourselves outside Rosamorland Monastery. This is the non-fighting skip I use to get to the Grish, a cast Feverfall, and jump to the side here. Once in time, talk to the trader with the funky hair and buy the gloves of dexterity. These will be our permanent gloves for the entire run. They settle dex to 18 and gives plus one to a tank. Caustic band if you still have money. 
one of the things needed for our build is the hag hair. I recommend doing it when you're at least level 5. I almost forgot. Let's quickly go over level 4 and 5. My spell choice for level 4. I recommend hold person. Like check this out. I cast hold person on Nia and my girls went to town. My preference for fame is alert. At level 5 we get our flourishes back when we shot res. I got spotted trying to set up for the hang. See, Shadowheart made her wet. Okay. Casting a spell made her split into more hangs. But guess what? Only one of them has the wet satyrs. I destroy her with flourishes and haste. Once I get her low enough, I run next to her and end my turn. Wait. Wait. Oh. They're going to choose plus one to strength. Also, if you can't pass the roll, just give up Marina. <laughs> Whilst we're on the topic of permanent strength boost, get a star in to suck off the drill. We should be at 20 strength now. I'm going to split this act into three chapters. Shopping, items acquired for gameplay, and leveling. There is a lot of shopping in act 2. So this chapter is entirely purchases. Starting off with the Moonrise Traders. With Farage we get the rescue ring for advantage on attack rolls. This ring is unbelievably good for smiting. The rude bugbear has the Halberd of Vigilance, which will be used once we get smites. He also sells the Titan String Bow, which we'll use at level 7 when we get proficiency with our Paladin Dip. This bow slaps, especially with our 20 strength and gloves the dinks. Our next stop is Quartermaster Tally at last want. The UNT Scale Mal is incredibly strong as it adds your full dex modifier to AC and it doesn't impose disadvantage on stuff janks. Clicker protection is nice. Plus one, plus one. AC saving cry. This is the amulet of the Harpers and the shield spell is honestly so good. Hey, wear this to sleep every night as a dark urge. Trust me on this one. P.S. Stay with your risky ring too. With the shopping out of the way, we go to the Mason's Guild. I was surprised to find out that Knock worked on this keyhole. After beating up the shadows, this is the chest for after. Inside is the best helmet for Abaddon. The helmet of arcane acuity. Whenever we deal damage with a weapon attack, we gain plus two to spell attack rolls and spell DC, stacking up to 10. Actually, it's pretty crazy. Look, check out these percentages. Our next task is playing hide and seek with Oliver. Oh no, I got spotted. What will I do? Shadowkey casts Envious and she sneaks up to Oliver, pickpocketing his ring. This ring gives us pass event trays, a spell which adds plus 10 onto stealth checks and lasts until long rest. We can equip the ring, cast the spell and change rings afterwards. Now on to leveling. At level 6 as the Swords Bard, we get an extra attack. Generally in a playthrough, once a Swords Bard reaches level 6, they pop off big time. Two flourishes a turn is deadly. With a range slashing flourish, you can actually shoot twice. And four attacks a turn from the time string bone is a bit silly. With the melee slashing flourish, he can hit two enemies at a time, and I have to mention this, he can smite both of them. Mobile Flourish is a nice way to eat your enemies. And finally, the Defensive Flourish gives you a whopping 4 AC. Onto level 7, which is pretty big for us. This is our dip into Paladin, and we can finally use the Titan String Bow. Paired with a level 7 support who can cast greater Invias, he can pretty much steamroll through Act 2. Just look at me disrespect to Yuga, one of the hardest fights in Act 2. Before we discuss level 8, I have to talk about my favourite spell, Greater Invisibility. With every action you take, you have to roll a stealth check to stay invisible. The first stealth DC is 15, the following is 17, and it increases by 1 per check. This spell is literally Gavo when you don't use pass without trays. These checks are also the reason why we invested in stealth proficiencies. Level 8. Our second and last level in Paladin. Finally, the Stealth Paladin meme is alive. Sweetie, guess what? Divine Smite. My fighting style preference is great weapon fighting, which rerolls your dice if you roll a 1 or 2. And the most important spell to gram is Command, which will use a lot in Act 3. Here's what the Stealth Paladin can do. I first cast Passive Out Trace and then an extended Greater Invis from Shadowheart. I give Malice a taste of a Divine Smite. And this was his reaction. I've got a long road ahead. Must have been the wind. Mm. 
I did over 300 damage before Malus noticed I existed. And guess what? I get a surprise round on top of that. This fight was over before it started. Level 9, we grab Greater Invis because why not? Welcome to Act 3. Let's get you geared up. First up is the Circus. Steal or purchase the ring from the Jin. This will trigger him and you'll get sent to the jungle. Here cast Invis and hid inside the cave. Whilst inside the cave, I climb up these ropes and jump onto a log. I jump again to this flat area to find a backpack that has the band or the mystic scoundrel. After you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can cast an illusion or enchantment spell as a bonus action. Go on, check this out. I start things off with a double smite. This builds my arcane acuity. Let's see what we got here. A 90, a hundred, a hundred. Our next weapon can be found in a chest near the end of the jungle. After being chased by a pack of angry dinosaurs, I jump towards the chest in question and use knock on it. This has got to be the hardest thing to pronounce. No Rona, Naruna, whatever. Is a legendary plus three trident that does piercing damage and is super strong. Heading in to the lower city, we find ourselves at Stormshore Tabernacle. We lockpick our way down this hedge to find an amulet of the devout sitting in a chest. This gives Pasu to spell save DC. Our next stop is the Devil's Fang. Both my characters failed each arcana check here. <laughs> It was actually so bad that I had to use a hiling to pass it. By passing this chank, we get access to the good stuff, and we pick up the Cloak of the Wave for the plus one to spell rolls and desaying. This next armor is my favorite, and I don't think enough people know about it. Let's start the Unholy Assassin questline. Shadowkey casts Fog Clown, and I give Korra a poke. These guards are bloody worthless. Huh? Moments later, old maid approaches me. Something, something. Sloppy. Same sloppy technique for Nesha. Fog cloud. Stabbing. <laughs> and we get a hand. Old maid approaches me again, and he's as cooked looking as ever. After learning the passphrase, we enter Kendall Hello. Move the painting and press a button. Sicarius. I get paralyzed by Dollar. And he critted me for 114 damage? I was scared for my honor mode save at this point, so I bound to reset the fight. I got revenge by casting Hold Person and smiting him. That's what you get for paralyzing me. We approach Cerebunk, smite a red flying elephant, and take a lovely bath while we're here. An emptiness grows within you, Paladin. Something has been lost. Cool story, bro. Anyways, for an unholy assassin now, and we get access to the straighter. Ah, yes, Balasama. Enemies within two meters become vulnerable to piercing damage unless they are resistant or immune to it. I can't express how much I love this armor. I don't care that I'm wearing light armor on a paladin. You can fight me in the comments. By now, you should be level 10. And really, the only important thing to note here is the savage attacker feat. I absolutely love this feat on a paladin, as it rerolls your smart dice as well. And I personally find it skyrockets my damage. <laughs> See you, bestie. Next, I was brave enough to take on an ancient undead dragon with just two characters at level 10. Before heading out, I picked up a globe of invulnerability scroll. Sap these dragon heads to head down to the dungeon. This is my answer dungeon skim. Head down to the chess room and fail this game three times on purpose. As you make your third move, go invisible, as the enemies will shortly spawn. Seeing as we failed the trials, the door breaks, allowing us to progress through the dungeon to confront Anta. The solution to the Anta fight is the Glaive of Invulnerability. The most important thing is how you position it. Here I use the character highlights as a reference. I want to place it close enough that Anta isn't highlighted or protected by the globe, but also close enough for me to hit him. The placement of the globe also negates his reaction when you attack him. 116 damage, yeah nah not bad. Our time limit for the spell is 3 rounds, but it should be fine because I tried this build in many playthroughs and it does over 200 damage a turn. Globe is the gimmick to this fight. Shh. 
Shadow Q gives him the final smind. And we obtain Boulder Ann's Giant Slayer. Just to note, only after recording and streaming an entire playthrough with this build, did I realise the Hellas armor only works with piercing damage. I have difficulty reading, alright? Naruna can synergize with the armor, along with other piercing weapons. If you're doing a good playthrough, Helldask or the armor of agility paired with the Giant Slayer can work. Let's go over the final two levels. At level 11, I recommend Hold Monster. At level 12, we get Magical Secrets, meaning we can pick any two spells. A general recommendation would be Counter Spell and something else. Spirit Guardians is a really strong spell out of stealth. Like, check this out. But personally, I was looking at Death Ward as insurance for my honor run. Or pass me at Trace because I'm built different. Anyways, have fun and let me know how you go in the comments. I'm casting Guardians, you know. Ayo.